Our government has funded research in everything from vaccines carried in food, such as bananas and tomatoes, to edible contraceptives. This kind of technology has widespread implications, and the regulation on testing of these pharma crops is just not as stringent as you might think. In July of 2002, a report raised concern about 300 secret locations across the United States growing experimental drugs on food crops. Just one mistake by a biotech company, and we'll be eating other people's prescription drugs and our cornflakes. Yay, cereal! Hold on, Timmy, that's not your average breakfast cereal, that's... Pharma Flakes, they're engineered delicious. What's engineered? Well, Timmy, we took your regular food into a lab so scientists could make it the most pharmaceutically powerful food in the world. Wow, it's like having a doctor in my kitchen. No prescription necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Side effects may include dizziness, nausea, irritable bowels, memory loss, sterility, infertility, heart palpitations, dementia, cancer, organ failure, coma, and even death. Pharma flakes, they're engineered delicious. Throughout the early part of the last decade, a biotech firm named Prodigene was growing pharmaceutical drug components of genetically modified corn crops in open air testing fields throughout the Midwest. So we've taken a day trip to College Station, Texas, the location of the University of A&M specializing in agriculture, and we're now gonna take a drive through the former headquarters of Prodigene, the now defunct company. Here's the building that used to house Prodigene. Headquarters. No longer any direct sign of Prodigene other than the greenhouses we saw on the back side of that building. Behind me you could see one of Prodigene's greenhouses where they undoubtedly did research. Prodigene's cornfields were filled with GM maize that was engineered to produce hepatitis B vaccine ingredients, a gastrointestinal pig virus, a blood clotting agent, an insulin enzyme, and GP120, an AIDS virus protein for an experimental vaccine. In 1996, members of Pioneer Hybrid joined with Texas-based pharmaceutical company Teramed to create a spin-off company called Prodigene. Founder John Howard had worked as the head of Pioneer's worldwide plant biotech program from 1987 to 1994, before becoming the director of Pioneer's protein products division, which he founded to develop and produce recombinant protein products from plants. John Howard's attitude towards biotechnology was profiled in Dan Charles' book, Lords of the Harvest. Here's a passage. What does genomics lead to? Ha ha, that's the question, isn't it, chortles John Howard. It leads to a very fashionable statement that investors get really hot about, and a lot of money. As a benefit to society, it's great. But how will you make money in it? How will you make money in plants with it? Howard believes he knows the answer. It involves taking the agriculture out of agricultural biotechnology. Howard wants to turn plants into pharmaceutical factories. Prodigene became the first company in the world to successfully produce commercially viable recombinant proteins from genetically enhanced plants. Further, in February 2000, the company claimed to be the first to successfully demonstrate an edible vaccine in pigs. In October 2000, Prodigene was given a broad patent for production and delivery of oral vaccines for human and animal immunization against all viral diseases. Then, in November 2000, the National Institutes of Health granted Prodigene funding to develop an edible AIDS vaccine made with glycoprotein-120 found in the simian SIV virus. The use of GP120 was originally intended to target vaccine delivery in the developing world. Roberto Fernandez Larson from AIDS Science, a publication for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, interviewed John Howard in April 2002 in a segment titled, Eat Your Corn Flakes and Get Vaccinated. John Howard stated, quote, This part of the plant can be formulated into something really palatable for people to eat. It does not change the taste of corn, and we could process it into cornmeal, for example, or other products that people would want to eat. For GP120, we are actually targeting the edible property as a higher priority. Howard hinted at the use of edible vaccines in the developing world, stating, quote, As mentioned, the corn can be processed into something like a wafer or tablet that people can eat. Howard and his team claim to have put as many as five genes in the same plant while keeping its effectiveness. Prodigene's ramp up towards full-scale production was also backed by the USDA, which provided a quarter million dollars of assistance in 2000. 
With further grant money from Iowa, Prodigine planted its secretive crops in Manson, Iowa and Aurora, Nebraska. CEO Anthony Laos bragged that within a decade, more than 10% of all planted acres of corn would be using Stauffer and Prodigine seeds to produce pharmaceutical drugs grown in corn and claim a huge share of the ever-expanding pharmaceutical market. By April 2002, Prodigine announced a major milestone with SIV subunit vaccines towards producing an edible AIDS vaccine, leading to further NIH funding. According to Prodigine's press release, subunit vaccines work by introducing small quantities of protein from a virus in the body, which encourage the production of antibodies. These were carried on the corn-based vaccines under development. However, the promise of Prodigine's research would be challenged by a scandal that unfolded that fall. In 2002, the USDA caught and fined Prodigine a quarter of a million dollars after two separate incidents of its pharmaceutical corn escaping its test bins and contaminating food crops intended for human consumption. Moreover, the farmers were never even told exactly what they were growing in their fields. Instead, Prodigine only vaguely hinted at what was being developed in their experimental crops by telling them it was a protein. The Stauffer Prodigine program contracted farmers to grow identity preserved seeds, where experimental drugs were produced without disclosing what was being cultivated. Stauffer Seeds Spring 2001 newsletter explained that along with Prodigine, it had developed a quote, total containment system to prevent contamination of their biopharmaceutical products. Prodigine's food contamination scandal was much bigger than just the $250,000 fine that was imposed by the FDA. Its leaders faced possible jail and criminal investigations, and even more importantly, it lost confidence in the genetic modification market as well as the pharmaceutical industry it had hoped to be a major player in. In 2002 numbers, pharmaceuticals accounted for more than $350 billion in industry funds, and it hoped to comprise up to 20% of it with the development of biopharmaceutical drug products. Aside from the fine itself, Prodigine was required to pay $3 million in restitution for the 500,000 bushels of soybeans destined for human consumption in products like baby formula. Prodigine had been testing its crops on 96 different sites. All of these were genetically modified varieties that scientists hoped could produce drugs in more volume than ever before. GMOs in general have become extremely controversial with the American public. In the case of Prodigine, they were testing these biopharmaceuticals on the backs of genetically modified corn grown in America's heartland next to major food crops, including corn and soy destined for Americans' dinner plates. Public outcry ensued when the government essentially paid for the cleanup, handing Prodigine a $3.5 million interest-free loan and giving them a year before they had to start paying it back. The USDA kept quiet about the settlement with Prodigine, and some felt the agency had deliberately hid the details from the public. I think there was a conscious decision to create an illusion that this was a more severe penalty than it really was, said biotechnology activist Gregory Jaffe. USDA spokeswoman Alyssa Harrison said, it wasn't that we made a conscious decision not to release, it didn't occur to us. That's right, it just didn't occur to the government that the public would want full disclosure on how the USDA basically slapped Prodigine on the wrist, paid to clean up its mess, and all the while it's threatening our food supply. Still to this day, the USDA has not released information on what specific drug components were growing on the GM corn that got out. After the scandal, the USDA fulfilled its watchdog responsibilities and immediately shut down Prodigine in the best interest of the American people. Wait, I read that wrong. The USDA continued to offer assistance to Prodigine, giving $150,000 in 2003 and $296,000 in 2004. The agency also quietly continued approving Prodigine's permit applications to grow more pharmaceutical GM corn in Nebraska. The National Institutes of Health also renewed Prodigine's edible AIDS vaccine funding in December 2003. Before they went out of business, 
it received a $6 million investment from the Governor's Biotech Partnership, chaired by Tom Vilsack, Governor of Iowa. He didn't want any restrictions placed on experimental farmer crops and instead didn't think that they should be kept from food crops, saying, quote, we should not overreact and hamstring this industry. Many people believe Prodigene received a slap on the wrist because it was a darling of Vilsack's Governor's Biotechnology Partnership. Tom Vilsack, he was governor of Iowa for two terms. During the Obama administration, he's been head of the Department of Agriculture. And this is very important, and he's done almost everything he can to promote genetically modified foods. He was named Governor of the Year by the Biotech Industry Organization, which is a lobbying group. Prodigene is yeah. iconic of the profits and future potential for the entire biopharmaceuticals industry. Overlapping the main scandal was a lawsuit brought against the USDA for allowing Prodigine Monsanto and two other biotech firms to grow pharma crops in Hawaii between 2001 and 2003. In August 2006, a federal judge ruled that the USDA had violated both the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act when it allowed the cultivation of drug-producing GM crops in the state of Hawaii. The court actually found the USDA had acted in utter disregard of the two laws because it failed to conduct even preliminary investigations before granting approval for the growing of these crops. And the case primarily concerned four permits that had been issued to Monsanto, Prodigine, Garst Seed Company, and the Hawaii Agriculture Research Center, which allowed them to grow drug-producing corn and sugarcane at various locations throughout Hawaii. And the plaintiffs in the case also challenged the fact that the USDA refused to disclose the locations where experimental chemical producing GM plants were being grown and what substances those plants were being developed to produce. The innovation of genetically modified crops would have a big impact on foreign policy. A year before the Prodigine scandal broke, then President George W. Bush had appointed Prodigine CEO Anthony Laos to the board for International Food and Agricultural Development, or BIFAD. BIFAD is the only presidentially appointed board that directly advises the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, on agriculture and food insecurity in developing nations. In other words, a man overseeing a company in the middle of one of the biggest GMO contamination scandals in the nation's history was simultaneously influencing American food aid policy overseas. In the bigger picture, it's on record that U.S. foreign assistance programs are using taxpayer money to subsidize genetically modified food aid to third world countries, while at the same time financing genetically engineered research that's going on in those same countries, raising serious ethical questions. Back at home, Prodigine was allowed to continue its risky venture with biopharmaceutical crops. The incidents in 2002 with Prodigine was not the last time that Prodigine showed up being non-compliant for these biotech products. Actually here on the USDA Biotechnology Non-Compliance History, it shows that in 2007 they settled with APHIS because of violations surrounding more of their permits. And this has to do with a 2004 GE field test of a corn variety modified to produce pharmaceutical compounds. APHIS alleged the company did not manage the fallow zone properly, allowed oats being grown in that zone to be harvested and baled for use on farm animal feed. So farm animals were eating the pharmaceutical compounds that were growing in these test corn fields. It said that they did inspections of these fields and they found that volunteer corn was growing and flowering within the fallow zone. It was also found in a nearby sorghum field. But it also goes on to say that Prodigine had agreed that it and its successors and interests would never again apply to the biotechnology regulatory surface through the USDA for a notification or permit to introduce any more GE organisms. They were banned from doing it in 2004. During our investigation here at True Street Media, we found that Dr. John A. Howard, the same guy who founded Prodigine and also founded the Applied Biotechnology Institute, is continuing the same research at ABI that he was doing at Prodigine when those fields were basically threatening our food supply. And this is despite the fact that Prodigine was banned from any further permits through the Biotechnology Regulatory Service. That same year, John Howard, who co-founded Prodigine, also decided to go ahead and co-found Applied Biotechnology Institute out of College Station, Texas, the same 
city where Prodigy was located. So that same exact year when they're getting cited for this and saying you can't apply for any more permits for these regulated biotech items, he's founding another company. And if you go to the USDA website and look at status of permits, notifications, and petitions for these regulated items, go ahead and put in Applied Biotechnology Institute shows up and here you go. Here's their movement permits for more of this pharmaceutical corn. In fact, Applied Biotechnology Institute was already receiving small business grants from the USDA in 2005. Basically, the ship he was on was sinking, so he jumped onto a new ship. The experimental work and the funding streams from the government never stopped. Starting in 2008, the National Institutes of Health began funding Howard's pharmaceutical crop research into developing an orally delivered hepatitis B vaccine via corn through the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The study's abstract claims plant-based production systems have the potential to meet the goals of an ideal oral vaccine. These have shown great promise in animal trials, including the ability of a plant-produced hepatitis B antigen to elicit an immune response in a human clinical trial. The project is currently in phase two, but according to Howard, successful completion of phase two aims will lead to a clinical trial and to a commercialization path with a human health partner. So far, the NIH has paid John Howard over $3 million to continue this hepatitis B vaccine research. 727,729 of those dollars were paid to him just this year. So while Prodigine is essentially defunct and barred from getting any further permits to do this kind of pharma crop testing, its founder is essentially continuing this kind of testing with the explicit financial backing of our government. Protogene's mistakes gave an eerie warning about the potential dangers of genetically modified crops, but instead of leading to greater transparency, it's driven the biopharmaceutical market further underground and further and further away from public awareness, scrutiny, and accountability. And Protogene isn't alone. The USDA Animal and Plant Inspection Service website, a non-compliance page, logs a dangerous precedent of irresponsibility when it comes to testing genetically modified foods and a lack of serious control on an industry that seems to continuously endanger our food supply. APHIS required the company to purchase and destroy several the field tests included plants engineered with insect resistance. The company also moved regulated GE material without notifying APHIS. Fifteen papaya APHIS. plants genetically engineered for virus resistance were allowed to grow on an experiment. written warning had already been sent to the permit holder for infractions. The company allowed the volunteers to release pollen within commercial corn planted over the field tests. After tests required by the EPA indicated a small amount of genetically engineered corn had cross-contaminated. They inadvertently shipped these seeds to multiple multiple U.S. and international investigators planted and moved interstate genetically engineered corn seed without obtaining U.S. IES investigated the case and Monsanto paid a stipulated IES penalty. investigated and Monsanto paid a stipulated penalty of just two thousand dollars. Stipulated penalty of just three thousand three hundred dollars. But the implications of farming with the pH go far beyond just producing components for pharmaceutical drugs, however controversial. As far back as the late 1990s, the Rockefeller Foundation was issuing grants to research institutes for the direct development of consumable, edible vaccines that carry disease-fighting agents, vitamin supplements, and contraceptives to limit fertility in the developing world and beyond in ordinary fruits and vegetables like bananas, potatoes, tomatoes, and yes, corn. So Prodigine's misadventures with pharmaceutical crops is only one part of the story. There's also edible vaccines that have been developed by the Rockefeller Foundation since the late 1990s and today the Bill Gates Foundation and others and you've got the Boyce Thompson Institute at Cornell University doing the first edible trials of edible vaccines using potatoes back in 1999 with a Rockefeller Foundation grant and part of the research was also conducted there in Mexico and this was particularly done by a scientist named Charles Arntzen, who's now at Arizona State University, where they similarly do a lot of biotech research 
on edible vaccines. And he's used potato, tomato, here's his banana vaccine. And all of this has been directly sponsored by the Rockefeller and Bill Gates Foundations and similar people. And it's headed directly for use in the developing world. So they're saying eating a banana that carries a vaccine or a similar food could be an easy way to deliver disease fighting agents, birth control, cancer therapy, and the potential is also there for their intention not to be disclosed. Another biotechnology company that received major government backing during that same time period was Epicyte. Epicyte was working on several plant-based vaccines and treatments, including HIV AIDS, genital herpes, diarrhea, pneumonia, and contraception using a rare class of human antibodies that attack sperm. In 1998, Epicyte and Protagene announced a strategic alliance to produce antibodies in plants. Soon after, Epicyte, along with the Boyce Thompson Institute, received a $2.8 million Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, research grant from the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command for Epicyte's drug delivery platform, superficially for treating pulmonary infections. Epicyte also received two $100,000 NIH grants for the anti-herpes antibody production and for anti-sperm antibodies grown in corn. In 2001, the company's CEO, Mitch Hine, announced, we have a hothouse filled with corn plants that make anti-sperm antibodies. Essentially, it's genetically modified corn that makes men sterile when they eat it. Epicyte disappeared soon after the announcement, after it was sold off to another company that later went out of business. But the project was a success, begging the question, where's that corn? Listen to this excerpt from the Prodigene website on their webpage, Oral Vaccines Made in Plants. Better products. Imagine a day when taking children in for vaccinations will not involve a single tear being shed. Imagine that, in place of a shot, the doctor gives your child a small bag of edible treats. This bag of treats will not be any ordinary snack. It will be an edible vaccine grown in corn and then made into an appealing snack. Our food, our food has changed more in the last four decades than it had in the 40,000 years prior to that. It's nothing like what generations before us ate. How can we trust our government to protect us from these pharma crops when they won't even allow us the transparency of knowing if genetically modified organisms are in our food? As if the open field testing of these drugs wasn't potentially dangerous enough, in 2006 it came out that six individuals who are otherwise healthy agreed to undergo testing by a German biotechnology company for a recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody that would work as a super activator of T-cells. Ultimately, all six participants ended up with inflammation and organ failure, and one of the participants was put into a coma. The USDA, while giving lip service to food safety and regulation, has secretly been one of biopharmaceuticals' biggest funders and biggest supporters in the public arena. It's clear that profits are put above human health. 